Hi, welcome to the Connected Caroline Show. Today's guest is a very special lady. Her name is Carrie David, and she's going to tell you all about the fabulous things she is doing with her day job and also her nonprofit over and above Africa, which she does incredible work. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. (laughs) So so lovely to be with you always. So lovely to see you again. You're getting younger. You need to stop that. (laughs) I love you. I wish. I wish. But let's talk about you. Let's talk about what Carrie David is doing now because um, you're a filmmaker. You have this incredible nonprofit that helps save uh, endangered species all over the world not just over and above Africa, which is where you started, right? And how are things going? And I want to talk about um, your life and, and, you know, passion inspires profit is my tag and profits of all kinds. And I would love to talk to you about, I think maybe starting with you, you moved from LA, the center of the filmmaking industry to North Carolina. What inspired that move? (laughs) And and tell us, tell everybody, how has it been for you? Is, was it a good good move for you? It was an excellent move for me. I wish I'd done it a lot, a lot earlier, um, but you get to it when you get to it. And what inspired it was that it was kind of like a perfect storm because I had just finished three projects in a row. Um, like a lot of things were coming to an end for me. I was ending a relationship. It was, you know, there's a lot going on. And then I had a couple of friends who had moved out here. Um, one is from here. And then I had another friend who moved out here from LA and they kept sending me houses. And I was thinking, it can't possibly be that cheap. <laughs> These like mansions. We wouldn't get your postage stamp in what's in LA, right? So I was a, I was kind of lured by the lifestyle. Um, I grew up on a farm and so it was going to be, I wanted to get back to nature. And I thought maybe if nothing else, like a timeout. I didn't, don't know that I intentionally came out here to move forever but it was a great move um it was such an easy move i had a friend who drove across country with me we had a blast so i got here and while i was looking for a house to buy um my real estate broker introduced me to a lovely lady she is um 80 a real firecracker her name's maggie and three days after i moved into my rental that i was renting from maggie she said um she texted me and said can i come down i need to i need to tell you something so i was thinking she's gonna say here's the gas shut up right so, so i said sure come on down so she came and she sat down and for the next i think like two hours she told me about this story down in um new hanover county that was um well, to be honest it was shocking and i got to she got to the end of it And she said, don't you think I'd make a great documentary? And I said, oh my gosh, I'd make an amazing documentary. She goes, well, you should do it. I've been there three days. I mean, I hadn't even like (laughs) put my feet down and got wet, right? And I said, you know, um, oh, well, a whole lot of things happened. And I said, well, I'll go down and I'll meet a couple of the, the key players. And I did, I spent the day with an incredible professor of English at UNCW and also a novelist of note, uh, Dr. Clyde Edgerton and a firecracker preacher, Doc, um, uh, that's Dante, Dante Murphy, who is also the president of the local chapter of the NAACP. So you've got this sort of fiery white guy, fiery black guy. They came together for this project, which for me, the allure at the beginning was just systemic racism that was happening in this school district and it was just out of control. But from that, what we uncovered was horrendous child sexual, emotional, and physical abuse going back decades. And that it was a cover up culture. So there was all this collusion happening and we wanted to sort of like dive into it. And that's what we did. And so it's been three years now. Well, we're in our third year. And I just last week decided that this cannot be a documentary and that we have so much that it's going to be a docu-series. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. So stay tuned for that. Do you have a, what's it called? It's called open secret because it literally was an open secret. Like I didn't actually break this story. Many people tried to break it down there. It was front page news month after month. It was on the television. It was everywhere, but it just doesn't seem to get out of this bubble, which is Wilmington. Um, It's a unique place, but this story really does have to be told. I mean, it's, um, and now I don't think you can contain it now. Like so much has happened Um, and it just keeps happening. And that's Mm -hmm. why it has to be a docu-series. I couldn't end it. Every time I ended it, something else happened and I had to go and open the film up again. It was getting ridiculous. So yeah, it's called Open Secret. And when when will it be out? So if we can, I'm going to pitch it now. Um, 
I've got an editor who's going to work on the docu series with me, and we have a Zoom on this Friday to talk about where to take it out. So we'll take it out and spend the next couple of weeks um, trying to set it up somewhere. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, that's great. Uh, it's fantastic what you do, and um, you have always followed your passions. I mean, you just really have, and you've been so successful. Let's dive into what's going on with Over and Above Africa and the documentary you made about the women rangers, the women that are rangers, which are unique, um, that are on the on the ground fighting the poaching war. So how how's that all shaken out? So you and I talked about the fact that we're both in common, which is an amazing organization, global organization. And so I was um, through common. I met somebody who was able to fund a documentary that was my passion project, which is Breaking Their Silence, Women on the Front Line of the Poaching War, which was what you were referring to. Um, and at the same time, I had already launched Over and Above Africa, which is when I found out about the endangered, the situation around endangered species. And I'm an animal, true animal lover. I was shocked. And so that's why I started that nonprofit. So, so I think of them, I think Over and Above Africa was a couple of years ahead, but I think of them now melded together. So we... Um, Right out the gate, we had members and donors. So I was willing and ready to just put my hand in my pocket for as long as it took and, you know, hope that it would take off. But we really didn't have to. Like right out the gate, it was something that people believed in. Um, but what makes us unique is that we actually film every project that we fund. And that way, for a lot of reasons, um, the best reason is that it, the donors can see where their money goes, literally see like the effect that they're having in Africa. So that, that's my favorite reason. But it also brings awareness to these critical issues that are not being discussed or that people think are not severe enough to get involved with. And so there's that is the awareness factor. And then of course, full transparency, just to be able to say, this is where we spend your money. Right, no, that's that's a great model. And also you kind of, you initiated micro funding, which we did. I, I, it's genius. And now you see it a lot more, but I think you were one of the first. And, <laughs> and explain, explain what that is, because boy, that really helped you get off the ground. And, and it's great for people. So many people want to participate in fundraising for endangered species or whatever, for, you know, helping the animals, um, you know, and they think that they can't because they're not, you know, big dollar people. So then you created <laughs> your microfunding program. Talk about that a little. We did. Well, it was, you know, sitting down and thinking about, I know people care, but you know, with especially how life is today. And this is, of course, before COVID. But, you know, money is money. It's tight for a lot of families, but people really do want to give. And we thought, well, we could go out and try to find five people to donate a million, but that doesn't do anything really other than sort of triage something on the ground in Africa. It doesn't bring awareness. It doesn't get people involved. But if we could get a million people to donate $5, now you have an army of people who not only understand the project, but they're out there proselytizing about it and telling people about it. And so we want that groundswell to happen because unless the entire globe steps up and says, and to the governments of these countries that are letting these animals be slaughtered and their body parts cross, cross country, um, they're gonna go. You know, in the last 50 years, we have lost 70% of our wildlife. When you think about that, it's extraordinary. I mean, that is that we're in the sixth greatest extinction right now and most people don't even know about it, but this is the first extinction that is entirely man-made. Mm. So I had to do something. And so we felt like if we, could, if we could make it affordable, if we could say, look, get in on the ground floor, it's $5 a month, you, you know, you can find that and you can really feel like you're giving and you're helping. And they are because it's accumulative. So, oh, and then- Oh, definitely. It's a, it's a great, great model, like I said. And um, can you talk about some of the wins that you have had, you know, cause it's been how many years now that you've been doing it's this nonprofit? The seventh year, seventh year. Seven years, wow. Yeah. wow. Well, I will tell you, um, last year was, was we were nervous because it's COVID, right? We're right in bang in the middle of it, starting last, last year. Um, I got a new executive director who I'd met while I was screening Breaking Their Silence. Her name's Connie Brooks. She's Hungarian and she is amazing. She's a wonderful woman, worked at um, Boston Consulting Group and had just quit her job because she had a three-year-old daughter and she wanted to do something that would really ensure that Maya, her daughter, would have endangered species around um, when she's grown up because Connie loved them so much. 
So mm-hmm. she and I spoke, we got together and we sat down and we really put a plan together for Open Web Africa. And last year, I mean, we did better than we've done in all the previous years accumulatively. We have now, we have a growing team of volunteers that are rock stars in themselves. We have Cheryl Pinto just joined us. Um, if you go to openaboveafrica.com and look at the advisory board and about us, you will fall over that these people are involved with, uh, well, I, I fall over on a daily basis looking at them. So, so appreciative. Um, and so now what we have is like, we really do think about, okay, where are we going to give? How are we going to give? How is this going to improve things? Um, and somebody who wants to ask me like monetarily, how are you improving um, uh, situations on the ground? And a lot of the time it isn't monetary. What we're actually giving people is dignity and we're empowering them to build their own community. We're not coming in and it's not charity, not in the old traditional way. We partner with our, with our friends on the ground, right? We don't come in and take over and just give them money and say, okay, now it's ours. We're like, how can we help? Can we mentor? You know, and so we're sort of seeing people they're just needing that money. We give them the money and the wins they have. And we're building friendships around Africa. It's just, a, it's a really very symbiotic relationship. Oh, it's so wonderful. And you also are doing this in other parts, regions of the world, right? And in the, in the film, um, Breaking the Silence, it, you go from, you're in Africa, but you're also in Asia and where else? couple different so we in the film countries. we do we go to asia um over and above africa we've we've stuck with africa we we're, we're in a lot of african countries i mean we're in rwanda kenya um we're in south africa we're in zambia we're in zimbabwe like we we've really branched out we were we were sort of focused with south africa at the beginning because we had so many friends on the ground there that we could um access initiatives that needed us now we're really widespread um and we get tons of people now coming to us and saying fund our programs so um it's a great place to be in that we can see all of these wonderful programs that are happening but we can't fund them all obviously which is sad but um so only in the film did we go to vietnam um we was in in africa we've done a couple of local like in 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 america we've funded a few charitable exercises but but really we are focused on africa gotcha gotcha Oh my goodness, so much going on. Um, so I love <laughs> the the fact that you moved to what, what would one think is the most opposite place for a filmmaker to thrive, community, <laughs> and you are thriving there. Um, would you recommend people like, you know, follow their passion like you did North Carolina. no you'll <laughs> hate it here this is this is a terrible place to, we were joking actually because we've now got about eight friends that have moved from Los Angeles to this area I mean I mean I'm talking like 10 minutes away and it's lovely to have that familiarity but we're like wait a minute no this is not little LA this is North Carolina we, we love how so are they all people. in the film business or are they all just in, yeah all came oh. from Hollywood yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Interesting. Even my two yeah. Friends, yeah even my two friends who were here before were married to um you know heavy hitters in the film industry so um but it's interesting you very rarely meet someone from North Carolina because you've got people coming down from New York you've got people coming down from New Jersey you've yeah got from Ohio of all places a lot of people from Ohio come here but well, we I mean, it got a buzz during COVID and it, it, my, a couple of my best friends from, from the Bay Area, they just decided to move to Raleigh. Yeah, yeah. there's so and, much going on here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. And I they're think, like, they love it. They love it. It's, yeah. It's, we are in our little bubble here in California. They're really, I came from England and I put my roots down in LA. So I've traveled all over the world, but I always came back to LA. So I know the West Coast inside and out, upside down. What's great about being here, you know, you're an hour away from New York and, I, and I'm discovering the East Coast, which I've never had an opportunity to do. And it's mm. just so different from the West Coast and it is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we go on road trips, you know, a co- now the COVID sort of easing up a little bit, we can get out a little more. But I was only here for, I think, five or six months before COVID really hit. And I was working on my documentary and I was going around film festivals, breaking their silence. So um, it kind of all shut down really quickly, but the, but the peace and quiet was just such a, I mean, it was so, I know some people have struggled with it, but it had the opposite effect on me. It was so calming and mm. I got to breathe again and like discover what I love doing and then just really do it and be less scattered. I totally can relate to that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So um, for Anybody that wants to participate and donate and get involved, what are the 
top three things they can do to help over and above Africa and your, and your you. mission, all of your missions. Yeah, thank you for thank you for asking me that because there are ways to help. We're about to have our second auction. We had a very successful auction in October. It's a silent online auction, um, and you can go to overandaboveafrica.com to find out all the details about it. But we have some amazing items on offer, like vacations in America and overseas. The prices you won't believe for two people. Like I want to go on them all, and they're good, <laughs> they're good for two years. So depending, oh, on that's COVID, huge. Yeah. So, so to help us that way, we raised so much money. Like right now, I feel like if just go on there and buy anything, you know, we've got mm -hmm. things at $15. We've even got a trip to um, climb Kilimanjaro. We've got a go to um, base camp and do a, an Everest adventure. Like there's some um, amazing vacations and just really, really fun things to think about doing. So I would say right now, that's the number one way you can help us. And we launched June the 1st and we'll be live for um, online for two weeks. And okay. then you can always come over and be a member, you know, sign up. We've got most people now are at the $20 mark. They've actually creeped up starting out at five. And now we get 20 bucks a month from most of our members. Um, so we can always, we can always do with more members. And then the third way is volunteer for us. You know, we have so many ways you can help us. Um, we're starting to really see our social media grow and we love just, just forward our posts, like our posts, comment on our posts. And we are at, over above Africa on Instagram mostly and, and Facebook. So they're the top three ways you could help us. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. And and then for people that closer to home, what, what do you think is the most helpful um, thing to do for people around their own home and in their community in terms of conservation and you know ecology and and helping our planet move forward and not backward? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, that's a big question, right? There's, there's just, yeah. some, I think the biggest thing across the board is having an awareness of, you know, you know, not everybody cares for animals. I understand that. But, you know, one of the things that we are promoting right now is how connected we, it all is. So we are one, you know, you want to take you, if you want to have um, a biodiversity, that's great for the world, then you've got to take care of the wildlife because that wildlife participates in that biodiversity, right? So mm -hmm. clean water, all of it is connected. And so we're sort of pit, preaching, not preaching, pitching <laughs> the yeah. idea of anything you do is going to help. So we say be more aware of what's going on. And it's so easy to go online and just click around on a few websites that are devoted to something that you're interested in. So obviously we're devoted to wildlife, but we also partner with the communities around that wildlife. So we're very much um, hand in hand with the villages and with the wildlife. Um, but I would just say awareness, like really get get involved. There's so much fake news around, right? There's all these stories about fake news, but you really can find the what's actually going on. And if you care enough, do one little thing. I've always said that if you just do one little thing mm -hmm. and then the next week you do one little thing at the end of the year, you've done 365 things to help the planet. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you so much. Well, wrapping up, is there anything else you want people to know about over and above Africa or about what's, what's next for Carrie David? What do you, well, what, I will What's tell you. What's coming up? Oh. <laughs> What's coming up is that I've got, um, so while I was filming Breaking Their Silence, um, which was a documentary, there were so many stories that we couldn't involve just for timing, but they were fantastic, fascinating, real adventures. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a fictional series set in this world? Right? I love that. So what I have to um, get on that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. So I sat down to write it with a really dear friend of mine, screenwriter Sharon Soboyle, and we came up with this pilot episode. And now we have Ian Henry Cusick from Lost. You might remember him as Desmond. He's mm -hmm. starring in it. And we have Sharon Leal starring in it. She's a supergirl. She was she was on Broadway in Dream Girls, one of the leads. Um, so and it's and what's really cool about it is like the our protagonists are two women, very, very different, but they both find themselves in Africa and they're going through these very different experiences. And uh, Sharon Leal is an Interpol agent. So you get to see the adventurous political, you know, side of poaching. Oh my God, how great. The other one, and, and the other one just lives on the land and she's she's a veterinarian. And so you see from her side, you see how poaching affects the commercial side. But really, it's like a big soap opera. So, um, oh, my God, I love it. And are you writing the whole thing? Yeah, we've written the pilot. We're really, really happy with it. And David Strayton is attached to direct it. And we have Monica Mesa as our showrunner. And we'll be, I know it just all came together so fast. And oh my God. In a couple of weeks. <laughs> that, okay, so this is my point. That move, following your heart. I want to yep. be in nature. I want to check out of the LA scene. Look at, look at how robust your life is. I mean, it's just amazing. 
Amazing. Know, right? Right. It's great. <laughs> I, I'm so happy for you. Oh, um, and me too. You, obviously, something you're doing is doing right too, because you look 20 years <laughs> younger than when I last saw you. And maybe COVID <laughs> slowed you down. I don't know, but you look so it refreshed. Did. Yeah. Oh, so happy. That is, yes, I am. It's great. I love where I live. And that, that you know, having, loving where you live definitely helps, right? Everything. I'm a you homebody. Know? So for me, it really is everything. Me, well, we all are. Who's not right. a homebody <laughs> anymore? I mean, so yeah. I, every, like the joke is, oh, I just, I realized through COVID that I really am a couch potato. And so that's, <laughs> that's a better way of saying, no, no, I think homebody is a better way of saying Homebody, homebody is better. <laughs> but I mean, it's true. I, I really um, just um, enjoy like a way slower pace than, yeah. and I, I love COVID for that because I, it, mm -hmm. it, it was crazy. Like the pace of people and our world was just like my nervous system couldn't yeah. take it. And it uh, yeah. just, and you know, and you did, you just kept trying to keep up. That was the biggest difference. Right. Really, realizing you're just like spinning and spinning in LA. Yeah. Everywhere you turn, somebody wants you for something, right. Or you want somebody for something. It's just, right. no or you have that, you. I'm not doing enough or I, you know, it's, it just never wasn't it, it, that FOMO was real. And so, yeah. um, it really just all that went away, got cut it yeah. all away. And so I definitely hope we don't go back to yes. any kind of, you know, because it was abnormal. <laughs> it was not a healthy, healthy lifestyle at all. It at was all. not at all. And we thought it was normal. And then it's not until everything stops and slows down that you're like, wait a minute. I actually did have for one moment when things started to speed up again, I got this anxiety of like, I can't do what I used to do. Like I used to get so much done in a day, right? I can't even, so now it's just like, I get what I get done. And the next thing that's carried over, I was never like that before. Like that yeah, I, same, same. It's just like, I'm not going to go crazy anymore, you know, with yeah. that pace. Everything I, you, don't, you, you don't want to. And then we have learned that everything is in its own time. My podcast was supposed to come out last fall and it just didn't. And I really had to just say, okay, whenever it comes out, it comes out. And that's yeah, sort exactly. of like, that's just you know, a healthy way to look at all of life, you know, just everything in its own time. Can't push it if it's, if it's not, you know, organically happening I naturally, you know, yeah. like your move, you know, like, yeah. oh, it's a really easy move. And I have someone to drive with me. Like I'm thinking, oh, see, just the doors open for you. And yeah. literally <laughs> also, like feeling that the, the things that used to come at you and you're like, oh man, I'm going to fix this and fix this. It's like something, sometimes it's just like, it's just the universe saying, go a different direction. Don't fix right. it. Not, right. it's not fixed. Don't fight it. Like just, that's just gently go wherever it's nudging you to go. I'm a big believer in that now. Oh, definitely. Oh, we should have a whole talk. <laughs> Next time I, we talk, we'll talk about that. Anyway, we're wrapping up and um, I do want to thank you for your time. I know you're super busy, super busy. Never and, um, never. and I love like connecting with you always. Always. Me too. me too. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, 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 to be here with you, to do this and to talk about things I love so much, my passions. Thank well, you. I, I love them too. I love them too. <laughs> so anyway, this is a wrap and uh, Carrie David again, over and above Africa, check it out. All the notes, will, all the information will be in notes. Until next time, this is Caroline with Connected Caroline. Make it a giving day. Bye.